city and state and other agency responses to the ongoing pandemic uh, in light of you know, some of the disagreements that we've seen. And I'll open that uh, to, to any of you uh, to, to start. Yeah, I'll just start off real quick. So I think from day one, it's been uh, seamless, at least the city agencies and working with our state partners led by Commissioner Murphy. Uh, uh, our coordination on the ground, as we say, is going to be uh, seamless and work well together. We, you know, we're not going to care about the political. We'll work through that. But our job is to get things done. And we work very well together on the city level, state level and through the state to our federal partners at the FEMA and uh, HHS and other agencies that we've dealt with during this crisis. So I could say we've, uh, there were a lot of lessons learned, uh, but the coordination was, uh, was, we couldn't have done it better. Uh, Tarek, Patrick, uh, uh, do either of you have uh, uh, thoughts on that? I mean, I would second that, uh, what uh, Andrew is saying. Uh, I mean, uh, at the org level, uh, and I would say, you know, when it comes to physical security, cybersecurity, and uh, other activities, uh, I mean, uh, M the MTA and uh, the city entities really uh, work together uh, because I, I don't think uh, any one of them can work, uh, you know, without the other. So, I mean, I, I really see uh, no uh, challenges or issues, you know, at, uh, in, in, in those areas. So uh, uh, I mean, that, that's how I see it. Yeah, so, you know, I, I would, uh, are there friction points as we go along? There always are. Uh, I think uh, the relationships that we have, uh, that we built over time, um, we're able to work through any of the issues we have. I, I think uh, as we coordinate at the agency level uh, on the issues that we're talking about here, um, we've been able to, to, to pull together and use each other's resources and uh, expertise to get there. Uh, and, and at the same time, we've pulled in from uh, private industry uh, to solve some of these problems for us, right? Because there, much of the expertise lies outside the city or the state uh, proper. Uh, and so we've, we've pulled these, uh, these resources together to be able to answer the, the mail. Uh, and I think you could use cyber as an example. Um, if we have an attack on a system and we need, uh, we need support, uh, we've pulled in a number of uh, contracts to be able to do that. And uh, it's a, um, uh, and they understand the systems that we're working with. They understand the threat that we're dealing with in order to get to where we want to go. And so uh, those, those responses, uh, I believe have been pretty efficient. Um, whether it's uh, um, a, a large uh, corporate response or it's uh, a specialized area that we've needed. So um, I think we've, uh, we've been able to pull the team and there's, there's a lot of resources to do that with. I could Thanks. mention, uh, speaking from the industry uh, point of view, uh, you know, I've been Microsoft 13 years and prior to that I spent uh, over 11 years in federal service. So I'm well aware of the, uh, challenges around, um, you know, collaboration, federation, things like that. Um, from our perspective, Microsoft, you know, we work very hard to make sure that our technologies are interoperable and that we provide, uh, many, you know, many ways for, uh, to enable, uh, for example, you know, it, you know, information sharing. So over the years, we've made a point to reach out and work with uh, uh, Isaacs, for example, uh, search organizations. So you know, we'll always uh, do our part to make sure that, that we're being uh, transparent, that we're you know, providing tools and data so that as you create the right collaboration structure between state and local governments, what have you, that at least, you know, you can still, you know, plug into our resources. I think we started a program several years ago that uh, was, I believe it was a New York State CISO office at the time, uh, was the lead organization. We were you know, sharing uh, threat data, which goes back about nine, 10 years. We were sharing threat data with the U.S. states, the state CISOs, through Albany as uh, you know as the uh, as the lead state level agency. So we're always looking to do more of those types of information sharing relationships. 
Um, thank you for that, Mark. Uh, so one thing I wanted to ask is, you know, as, as you look at the way that we have migrated services online, is there an area of life where you think we haven't yet been able to have the sort of level of transition that you think is appropriate just due to either financial constraints or security constraints or other constraints? Where do you see sort of further expansion of uh, online government, on you know, remote learning uh, and other remote systems going in the future? And I'll, I'll leave that open to anyone to start. I'll start there if that's okay with you, Albert. Um, so, I one thing that that I think is will come out of this as long term uh, is that we will go back in to some extent uh, to um, doing lots of things in person or doing them partially digitally um, uh, but then still requiring for example that you sh or at least allowing you to show up in person to get a service it could be a license it could be benefits could be anything. But what I think is not going to go back to the way that it was is that it will no longer be okay for that to be the only option. I think there is going to be a need for a lot of these services for there to continue to be a virtual option. Uh, and it's going to be seen as absolutely critical, fundamental to the way that public services are delivered. Um, and so I think that uh, what, what we haven't seen yet is um, the thinking about it at that level uh, for the long-term, what does that mean long-term strategically? What does it mean in terms of the way that you, you know, allocate your resources? How do you prioritize which services need to be available? Um, it's almost in the same way that you look and see uh, about accessibility requirements, right? So I think that, um, you know, one, one thing is uh, to platforms like Uncork, uh, we've been able to uh, assist in delivering those services. It's doable, the technology is there. Um, and so, you know, I think uh, you don't wanna be in a position again where either you can't quickly stand up the resources that are needed to continue to operate, or you people can't get what they need because it's not available virtually. And so I think, you know, that is one of the long-term um, strategic policy things that we need to, you know, the, that we're going to be seeing that we need to deal with. Like I mentioned, uh, that's a, a fantastic point. I'm thinking about, um, there's a pretty uh, prominent example right now uh, within the U.S., the, the federal space. For example, the Pentagon, uh, U.S. Department of Defense, you know, when tele when COVID you know was really breaking out, and uh, federal workers were sent home, it's in this case DoD workers, you know they set up pretty rapidly a uh, virtual tenant, let's say a virtual collaboration capability, and the CIO there has been very clear that uh, once this pandemic winds down, telework is still going to be here to stay, not in you know probably not one hundred percent, not but not zero, somewhere in that middle area. Uh, and this is, this is probably a case where the practical realities and the opportunities, particularly as employees uh, perhaps uh, tend to defer this, uh, tend to prefer telework more, um, the technology and the user demand is going to force the policy. Because uh, uh, if you think about, uh, you know, information handling um, requirements or what have you, FedRAMP, NIST, CGIS, what have you, uh, you know, I don't think telework's been carved out here yet. So we're going to have to, this will be a couple of years out probably thinking about how you you make this all okay uh, from a more permanent perspective. Uh, one, uh, one area would be um, data governance. You know, uh, I talk a lot with um, CISO teams, particularly federal CISO teams, and they're realizing that uh, as more of their employees work from home, that uh, perhaps the very the fact that you work from home, the fact that you're doing some level of collaboration uh, by itself means that perhaps not all of your data needs to be classified in certain ways. It's not all inherently sensitive. So there are going to be all these new scenarios coming out that that people like us are, are going to be uh, living with and then having to put some sort of uh, wrappers around. I would just uh, 
uh, complain a little, you know, or, or just, just a general comment. Uh, and, you know, my apologies to Cass. I think he wants to virtualize probably everything <laughs> in a way. Uh, but I certainly want the kids to go back to school and not be homeschooled. It's just, uh, uh, it, it's, uh, I, I think, you know, the, it's the socialization aspect. I think we've all talked about, you know, uh, when we talk to our friends and so that everything is virtualized and uh, especially kids schooling perspective it seems that they probably their learning probably is going to be better uh, the parents are going to be involved and uh, involved more uh, in helping their children uh, learn more but uh, I, th I think uh, this uh, uh, you know working with people and the socialization aspect of life uh, is something uh, uh, it, it seems that they are missing on it uh, uh, you know so, uh, so that's why I said that it's just a complaint on my part and because it's uh, also very loud. I mean, I had to tell uh, uh, my grandson, uh, you know, who, who is generally in my, uh, next to my office, that he has to go somewhere. He's six years old. He did not understand that he has to be somewhere <laughs> and he cannot talk loud while I'm on this call. And I think that's a, uh, a concern that's going to be shared by many, many uh, New Yorkers. One thing we haven't really touched upon is the unique privacy concerns and uh, security concerns of COVID-19 uh, health data itself, and, you know, especially as we see uh, the state working to roll out uh, a new uh, exposure notification system that collects a lot of uh, uh, personal health data and location data. I was wondering if uh, you could speak to just the state of privacy laws in New York in protecting uh, New Yorkers' information from, you know, lawful uses. Uh, and I, I, I think um, uh, first in, in mind for me is the bill awaiting the governor's signature on contact tracing confidentiality, but really the need for a broader slate of privacy protections here in New York. Um, so happy to, uh, Andy and Patrick, we didn't hear from you on the last question. So if we could start with you there and, and then maybe uh, continue. Sure, just to wrap, close the loop on the other one that uh, all the kids will be upset because there's never going to be another snow day either because they'll be remote on those days. But uh, yeah, I think one of the key things is to really try to, if you're uh, different programs that you're working on uh, to limit that data sharing to key people. Um, creating interagency data agreements, which always helps. An example, we had uh, a program during COVID in May, uh, thinking about seniors and vulnerable populations of uh, uh, folks who wouldn't be able to get out if it was hot and were lacking uh, cooling. So we had a Get Cool Air program where we supplied and installed with vendors 74,000 air conditioners. But how do you get that information? Uh, it was uh, the, with the privacy, uh, you had to be, uh, over 60, you had to be in a certain income level and you had to be involved in some sort of program in the city. So uh, to get that data, how do you do that? So uh, by having these data sharing agreements, limiting it, and if it was some sort of federal type of program these folks were in, we were really limited in scope of how we were able to do that. So we would have to get the Department of Social Services to handle that data and filter that information. So I think a limiting to key people, obviously medical information, we would never get that as emergency management, um, uh, that type of information, uh, personal information. So I think limiting to key people in, uh, and having these data sharing agreements uh, with agencies is, it helps us tremendously. And so, so I don't deal with the, uh, the privacy issues uh, very much. I know we, uh, there, that is a constant conversation that goes on uh, with both those that uh, we're trying to collect data from uh, and those that are managing the data in order to have an effective database to be able to make decisions. So we are, you know, in, 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 uh, in our case, we are consumers of the information to be able to make decisions to be able to provide the best health care, the best resourcing uh, to the uh, public. And, and that is really our position from where I sit is uh, that data is so needed to make the best decisions on resourcing and, and how you allocate those. Um, but, but I don't, uh, I'll stop there because uh, what, uh, what we're involved in really uh, and I can't speak for the for DOH and, and the other folks uh, in that area. Um, 
Oh, go ahead, Tariq. Uh, so, <clears throat> uh, you know, I, I live in a, a hot zone in a way, uh, uh, in New York's, uh, in Queens, Kew Gardens. And I have to really give kudos to New York City that they are really uh, uh, out there uh, getting, uh, you know, uh, this testing done uh, for everyone. And uh, there are so many locations. And uh, I have uh, my full confidence uh, that the city itself is going to protect the privacy and uh, security of the data. But at the same time, as I was, uh, you know, I was there to uh, get my test done. Uh, I realized uh, that it's it's uh, at the moment there are some things missing. So I mean I I believe that they're in a you know we're in a crisis mode. Uh, so I, you know we cannot ask for everything, but you know when I had my test done, I realized that they took my identification. Uh, they have my geolocation information, uh, of course uh, the sample uh, you know from my uh, you know body in a way. So. Uh, uh, and then there were a lot of people, uh, you know, being tested and that data being uh, recorded. So the concern was that, you know, at the moment, probably nothing is happening, but uh, in the future, it is going to be a bigger issue. And, uh, and, and in general, I think there are so many contact tracing uh, applications and, uh, you know, within the private sector, a lot of activity going on. Uh, and uh, they are getting tremendous, recording tremendous amount of data. And so we haven't seen anything, uh, you know, that we expect now that look, you know, uh, have some disclosure information. Are you going to give me an opt out information? Are you going to uh, delete my information if I uh, uh, ask to? So I, I think it's currently lacking and it's uh, really required. And my hope is, I believe there is a, uh, a bill in the Senate, uh, it's Consumer Protection uh, Act, I believe uh, specific to this. Uh, uh, you know, uh, by the Republicans. Uh, uh, and so my, my hope is that that bill would pass and they are, they are really, uh, to my surprise, addressing uh, many of these uh, requirements. And, and one, one last comment that I have is really goes back to, uh, you know, when we talk to or when we look at those applications, privacy policies, and uh, generally you read it that, look, it's going, to, your data is uh, going to be used uh, in an aggregated fashion, and uh, it will be de-identified. But at the same time, with the you know advances in uh, data analytics, and so uh, we know uh, that that's not enough of a sa safeguard. I mean, we have seen many examples uh, that the data, although it's de-identified, it can be reverse engineered to uh, uh, figure out that who that person is. So, so really, it seems like. Uh, uh, on the legislation side, number of activities going on. And, and also I want to point out, I mean, I think city and uh, particularly state in this case have enough laws in place. Uh, I think maybe they're not being, they should be. And I just wanted to uh, quickly add <laughs> that uh, that point on de-identification really is crucial that we'll often see uh, um, you know, statements made about de-identification equating anonymization, but, you know, especially when you're dealing with COVID, uh, you know, data, uh, including location data, proximity data, it's very easy in many cases to re-identify that information. Uh, uh, with, uh, and so it becomes really an urgent question of how do you pr provide those privacy protections. So Cass, uh, I know you wanted to add something at this point. Well, I just want, I want to say a, a couple of things. First of all, I've had the opportunity to work particularly with the city um, through the through the course of this and, and data protection has always been, you know, foremost um, in the way that they've approached um, all of the technology issues that I, you know, that, that I've been part of. So I, that's very encouraging. Um, I do think that it's very important at a foundational level when you make that technology decision, right? What are you going to use? How's this data going to be collected? Where is it going to be stored? Is it encrypted in transit and at rest? What are the retention policies and how is the de-identification done? Um, you know, for example, in our, uh, uh, in Uncork's case, you know, all of those things obtain just from, for any environment that we set up. Now you then have kind of the secondary and tertiary uses of data, right? People who need the data and, and have the right access to it, but maybe they're using spreadsheets, you know, for secondary or, or third uses. And, you know, you really need to make sure that the 
the way that you uh, use and retain uh, the data, even if you're, you're supposed to have access to it, um, uh, still, you know, is, is secure in all of those various ways. And so I think that, um, you know, it, it's something that a lot of progress has been made and a lot of care and thought has been put into it. But when you're in a crisis, it's not just about COVID test results. You're collecting a lot of information about a lot of different things. So super important from, uh, you know, the decisions about what you use uh, from the beginning and making sure that that follows through uh, till you're done. Definitely. And I think, uh, and probably I bring my own perspective here as someone in the, uh, more in the civil rights community that we, in addition to those threats, we often also look at, well, what's the threat of misuse from lawful actors, you know, and, and especially in a, you know, a sanctuary city like New York, which uh, wants to protect immigrant communities from, you know, federal officials, you, you know, that could potentially come in and hijack this data what are the legal protections to make sure that we can't, we aren't creating a tool that could be misused uh, through legal process uh, in the future. Uh, I know we just have a few more minutes. So um, I want to ask um, quickly each of you to, you know, tell us a bit about how your experience during COVID has changed your threat modeling for the future. Cause many of us were, you know, had, different, you know, scenarios in mind for how uh, catastrophes could impact uh, aspects of our work, aspects of our community. But I don't think many people really had this specific scenario fully mapped out. So how, what have you learned about the ways you model future uh, um, uh, risks to your operations, to the city uh, more broadly and to the state? Uh, and uh, why don't we start with uh, Andy, Patrick, Tarek, and then Cass and Mark. Sure. I always say prepare for the worst and hope for the best, right? That's what we always do. And even at the beginning of this, we went extremely high in uh, thinking what we were going to uh, what we were going to get, whether it was at the alternate care sites, uh, using these other surge uh, type of things, looking at these different models. But not even just with COVID, even with other things, with all these uh, Look at the storm season this year. We're in the Greek alphabet already. So we're always going to prepare. Sometimes we'll over-prepare, but uh, there's got to be a balance to that with funding and everything else. But we're always going to err on the side of caution uh, where, when it comes to public safety. So uh, if we have to prepare uh, more, we will uh, to make sure that the, the folks are safe. So I think we've learned a lot and we're always learning, right? This is with any kind of disaster. So we take those lessons learned and move forward. But uh, I think with modeling, uh, we're always going to look at different type of models, whether it's uh, for COVID or other things, and and uh, make a judgment and, and see how uh, far we'll go with it. So, thanks. And so I would I would follow up with with what Andy said. You know, plan, planning for the worst. Uh, something that uh, in the near term that we're we're not as concerned about. We don't put as much energy towards our mass gatherings. Uh, up until the right up until the end of the year and into January, um, mass gatherings were a focus for us uh, for uh, threat. So we we view the we view that threat differently today. We we'll, we will get back to mass gatherings of some kind uh, as we move forward, but um, uh, the the idea of how those are those attacks are uh, planned or or executed uh, look different. I think the idea of, of uh, figuring out what our vulnerabilities could be with remote work, uh, you know, whoever's listening in today, I'm sure is, uh, is scoping out what we're saying as, as with all of these conferences and everything, um, not giving up any vulnerabilities, but um, it does, uh, to nobody's surprise, offer a different set of vulnerabilities when we talk about cyber and, and, and how do we uh, prepare for that as we go forward as well? And so when you say how do we how do we look at the, the threats differently, both the physical and the and the cyber threats, um, it has morphed, and I think uh, uh, we've put more energy into it. You asked a question a little bit earlier about uh, about how do we handle this in in some way, and um, it is consuming a lot of resources uh, that could be used for other things. Um, but we have to prioritize what, 
what we're going to do with those. And I think if, uh, if leadership sees this as a, a priority, uh, there'll be plenty of opportunity to invest in uh, the protections from threats that uh, will emerge from this. So, I uh, turn, or Tariq, right? oh, no, no, go Sorry. ahead. I don't know. I did it again. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, uh, so in our case, I think I, I, I mentioned the MTA before this, uh, uh, you know, COVID-19. Uh, we had our offices, everything was on-prem. Uh, so in a way, we hid behind a perimeter. Uh, you know, we had uh, our walls and, you know, we protected our users. We felt comfortable. Now, uh, you know, that wall is broken, perimeter it doesn't exist, you know, here are these, uh, let's say 30,000 or so people trying to get into our systems and maybe more, you know. Uh, uh, so, so a couple of things, you know, uh, that really stood out for us, you know, not talking about the vulnerabilities, we realized that uh, it's very important for uh, users at home or who are working from home that they have uh, better awareness. Uh, because now there is more responsibility on them uh, to protect their systems, uh, to make sure they're patched, updated, their Wi-Fi is secure. So, uh, so I would say security awareness became uh, important for us. Uh, that changed. And another thing is really, uh, 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 you know, we allow bring your own device type of <clears throat> approach to people using in the past. That wasn't an issue for us, excuse me. <clears throat> Now, uh, you know, we have to worry about that part. And, uh, and lastly, as you mentioned that, you know, uh, uh, our third party contractors from threat perspective that we have to uh, really, uh, you know, include them in this equation that look, if they're affected, they may affect us. So we have to develop a process and plan uh, where we can work with them and make sure uh, that they are secure so that we are secure. Um, uh, just a couple of things. One is we know, we know that whatever happens next time, uh, and we're certainly not even through this yet, it isn't going to be exactly like this. So, you know, uh, we got to make sure we're not, we're not, it's not going to, we're not going to fight the last war, so to speak. Um, but I would say just being, uh, maybe a little bit of the, the technology, at least optimist here, what this crisis has done is really exploded a lot of myths about what is possible in terms of, remote working, remote service, remote, um, uh, and, and, and that has created lots of opportunity to strengthen in a very, um, you know, uh, in, a, in a very distributed, to just strengthen distributed working um, and distributed service delivery, uh, which can make, you know, society in general more resilient. Um, and so I think that, you know, we should capitalize on the gains here. Um, we, it is possible to essentially run, run the government, uh, from the smallest to the highest levels remotely, um, whether you're a worker or you're somebody who needs something and we should make sure that that, you know, not only remains the case, but that we make it even make the investments to make it even better, uh, as we move forward. I'll, in closing, I'll, I'll second what, uh, Cass said that, and I mentioned earlier that, um, you know, we're squeezing uh, two years of transformation into two months or at this point, six, seven months. Uh, going a level deeper, I would say uh, most of my time the last several months has been spent on talking about, writing about, uh, helping implement, um, let's say, uh, zero trust strategies, architecture, and identity driven uh, security models. And so, this has uh, internal to our company in terms of how we also are, you know, uh, uh, helping our employees help me help us all work globally, most of us from home. Uh, but also in terms of how we service our customers and work with partners around the world. A huge, huge amount of focus last, last several months, my IT perspective, in accelerating some of these. Uh, like I said, these are already these trends were already occurring, but accelerating the last several months, uh, move toward this. Um, you know, zero trust type uh, type environment. I fully expect that uh, to be a huge priority uh, next next few years. Wonderful, thank you all. So we have a few minutes for Q and A, uh, and 
Oh, I, I want to start with a really interesting question from the audience. As a reminder, you can use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to submit questions. So could I, I'd love to hear from each of you about how you see the rising threat of disinformation and misinformation, particularly related to COVID-19 and the elections. Uh, it seems to be really, it's something that has existed for years, but seems to be really accelerating uh, in recent weeks and months. And just uh, how do you view the threat and how do you view the potential responses? Uh, I'll give you a, just a quick one. Um, when we talk about uh, vaccinations, you know, where, where vaccines will be coming, they're under emergency use. There's a, a potential distrust uh, uh, amongst the, the certain uh, populations, uh, cultural differences. Um, how do we create uh, herd immunity uh, with that? And when, uh, when somebody uh, doesn't agree with, uh, with the way forward or mistrusts the way forward, um, that's our problem and and how do we get to the finish line uh, in all of this if we have misinformation uh, they're, they're, uh, the governor often talks about the facts and and there are facts that, that it's but the facts change every day too uh, as we have more information so uh, from from what we're talking about here uh, where, where misinformation is, uh, is heavily used, uh, we could prolong the, the pandemic, yeah, potentially. Uh, I don't know, I don't have all the information in front of me, but it, when you talk about misinformation, uh, this is an opportunity where it, it could cause us a delay in, in uh, recovery uh, from the, the pandemic. Uh, Andy, I, I'd love to hear your thoughts from the city level. I think just to echo what Pat is saying, you know, you really got to be nimble. Things are changing. Uh, you know, at the beginning, it was changing uh, every second, it seemed, you know, but uh, we got to be able to, uh, you know, once again, working with our, our state, federal, uh, our partners, uh, coordination is key to this whole thing. Um, and uh, as long as we uh, have open lines of communication, um, no matter what comes our way, we'll be able to get through it. That being said, you know, we have to be able to adjust and uh, on the fly, so. Uh, anyone else uh, have any thoughts uh, on this point, uh, sort of uh, combating misinformation, disinformation? I think that uh, it, it's Kaz here, just quickly. Um, one thing is also there's an accountability with 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 this with misinformation is is it possible in in the technology that you're using or the platforms that you're using or is it is misinformation out there is it possible do you recognize that and take responsibility for doing something about it and uh and i think you know we've seen differing responses to that set of questions um from different you know important actors in the space and so, you know, one thing that government can do is like work with actors who, who, who do take that accountability seriously and want to team up and make sure that where there are facts and where facts are important, as Commissioner Murphy said, that it is possible to, um, to uh, raise them above the, the din of, you know, whether it's misinformation or just wrong information. Microsoft, uh, for example, last week we announced a, uh, a legal action of enforcement to take down of a, of a, a Russian criminal organization that was targeting uh, various, I think, state level election uh, uh, organizations, I guess, uh, election bodies and such. So we'll keep doing that, uh, helping to defend the, the infrastructure of democracy. I know on the misinformation, disinformation side, we certainly have you know, partnered with others in industry. Um, maybe think it a little more proactively, you know, we have an initiative in the company, it's um, readily shareable, uh, call it ethics for AI. In other words, it's sort of a six step sort of gating function, uh, pre-qualification, you know, uh, function that will determine, you know, what type of AI we will support uh, if we'll get involved in projects. And 
uh, one of the key points in there is, uh, you know, accountability, transparency. So we, you know, we're making sure um, that, you know, if our technology is going to be used for a business purpose by whoever, that there are certain uh, you know, protocols and guardrails in place to make sure that, that we're not knowingly supporting any such uh, activity. I just uh, one comment, uh, you know, on my part, I think it's there, there's more of a, a human or psychological element here that uh, all of us uh, like to go to our sources of information. So those sources of information may be feeding true or false, we tend to believe, uh, uh, you know, those. Uh, on the technology side, of course, uh, you know, hope is that, uh, you know, entities like uh, social media platforms and so, uh, it, it seems like they're developing uh, or have processes in place to begin to at least counter some of the, the, that misinformation. Uh, but, but in general, I think all I'm trying to say is uh, we can control maybe the technology aspect of it, uh, but in general, we tend to believe uh, who we want to you know, listen to. So, uh, so this misinformation in a way will always exist. Yeah, and I, I think that's a really crucial point that there are ways that technology can certainly exacerbate these issues. There's way, ways that potentially can be harnessed to, to push back, but at the end of the day, this is a, a largely human issue. And it, it takes, you know, broader set of social tools to, to respond. Um, but I, we're out of time. So with that note, I, I just want to thank all the panelists and thank all of you for joining us for this conversation. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Albert. Uh, and thank you to all the panelists as well. Um, you can all hop off. I will go next to our second and final panel, a roadmap for reimagining public safety in New York. If you're on that panel, I ask you to bring up your video, uh, unmute yourselves, we'll get started uh, momentarily. Uh, again, this is panel two, a roadmap for reimagining public safety in New York. I'll note, um, we had one late scratch, Elizabeth Glazer, director of the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, uh, regrets she cannot make it, she's sick. Um, but I believe, I think everyone else should be logging on. I'll now hand it over to our moderator, Samar Kershid, senior reporter at Gotham Gazette. Uh, over to you. Thanks, John. Um, welcome, everyone. I think we have a great panel today. Um, and we're talking about reimagining public safety in New York. Um, we're joined by, um, I think we're waiting on the public advocate, but we'll have public advocate Jamani Williams, um, you know, who's been a long time um, proponent of reform, sponsored the Community Safety Act, which transformed how the NYPD conducts policing in this in the city. We have um, Council Member Donovan Richards, who chairs the Public Safety Committee, um, has, has led many of the city council's efforts to change um, policing, including marijuana arrests and um, low-level um, crime enforcement. Um, we have uh, Renee Ray um, from Conduit Transportation Solutions, which is a tech-focused solutions to transportation management. And I think we'll be talking about, a little bit about how um, the city can do automated te tech enforcement of um, traffic. Um, we, and we have Tom Smith from Rap Technologies. Tom is the co-founder of Taser and former president of that company and is now Work, now working with RAP, which created the Bola RAP, which is a non-lethal um, restraining tool. And um, we have with us Craig Longley, the executive director of Catholic Guardian Services, nonprofit provider of welfare services for um, families and individuals with special needs. Um, should we, I, I feel like we can wait two minutes for the public advocates to join us. If someone from his team will let us know, he's ready to go. Anyone there? <laughs> the public advocate will be on in just a couple moments. You can go ahead. Uh, okay. Um, so we're here to talk about reimagining public safety. It's it's become a big debate in the in the sort of wake of the pandemic um, and the George Floyd protests and the resurgent um, Black Lives Matter movement, where there's a national debate going on about how we reimagine and re envision how to keep people safe, keep communities safe. There's been, in, in this year's um, budget, there was a big discussion around defunding the police, 
that's happening around the country as well. Um, and we're here to get everyone's thoughts on how, what the newest challenges are around public safety, what the city needs to do with um, limited resources at its disposal, and how we can sort of promote public safety that focuses, I imagine this is what people are gonna talk about, uh, that focuses less on enforcement, less on police, and more community-based solutions. Um, why don't we kick it off with um, Councilmember Richards, if you'd like to tell us, um, you were at the center, you and your colleagues were at the center of the debate around, around defunding the police. How do, you, how do you view the conversation around public safety now and how the city can reimagine how it does that? Well, thank you so much for, for having me uh, this afternoon and uh, welcome to all the, glad to be on a distinguished panel with so many people who've done a lot of great work for, for the city. Uh, without a doubt, there is a public reckoning happening uh, around this country uh, and in the city. Uh, when we talk about policing, specifically for black and brown communities, for decades, I mean, we've encountered over policing in our communities, disparities in the way that our communities are policed. Uh, this is a very unique moment in time, I think, in my lifetime. And Sean Bell was my neighbor. Um, I literally saw his, his daughters grow up right before, before my eyes and really good friends with his, his uh, fiance, Nicole, would have been his wife, Nicole um, Bell. And I, I can tell you, we are at a time in history where the public, by, by rising up, has really challenged the institutions. And, and when I say the institution, the NYPD. Uh, specifically in law enforcement agencies from around uh, the country on what what should be our focus. It, is the police department the number one way to keep our community safe? And it's a really valid question because if the police department could, re could have resolved crime, uh, although we have seen historic lows in, in New York City, and obviously we've seen some upticks over the course of the last few months here and around the country when it comes to, to violence, if they could have resolved this issue, they would have resolved it a long time ago. So when you hear people talking about the need to reimagining, reimagine what policing looks like, you're talking about investment in communities. And when you look at the common denominator of crime and, and where uh, uh, increased crime occurs, there's one common denominator. The, the, the fact is that these communities are the ones that have historically seen disinvestment, when you talk about quality housing, when you talk about the lack of after school programming, community centers, the lack of job opportunities, um, you know, this, this, this is all the culmination of what drives crime in many of these communities. So I think at the council, the public rightfully pointed out last year that we need to look at this $9 billion budget and reimagine what we could do <laughs> with a billion dollars. And, and let me be clear, you know, when people talk about a price tag on addressing bias and uh, addressing racism and addressing over-policing com uh, over communities, it's not the number one factor. You know, there are a lot of policy changes that need to happen within the NYPD as well. But the culmination of having the budget and looking at policy and looking at leadership in a department, I think will certainly be something that moves this department uh, forward in a better way. And we're not there yet. There, there have been some minute changes, but a lot more work to be done uh, to make sure that the NYPD is accountable to our communities. Uh, I wanna welcome uh, public advocate uh, Williams. Um, you didn't miss much, we just started. Um, and I, I, I wanna pose this question to you next. Um, what is, how do you see New York reimagining public safety and um, what are the challenges do you think to changing how the city keeps its people safe? Uh, um, Mr. Public Advocate, we can't hear you. Are you on mute? Can you hear me? Uh, yes, sort of faintly. Okay. Uh, I don't know, is that any better? Slightly. Is, um, 
Do you have a volume? Can you turn the volume up or? Yeah, it's up high. I can try to put my headset in, but. Uh... Uh, yes, we, we can hear you now. Yeah, yeah okay, we can hear cool. you now. All right, cool. Thanks. Uh, peace and blessings, everyone. Love and light. Uh, glad to be on here. <laughs> Uh, this conversation. Uh, before I jump into that question, I, you know, I'd be remiss, and I just have to mention this, uh, you know, and I have a lot of love for city and state. Uh, I get first read every morning and night, uh, but I have to lift up the issue with Diana Richardson, who I stand with. Um, we have a lot of work that we have to do. Um, that, uh, that story, uh, I actually spoke to Tom Allen about it, so I appreciate his uh, conversation and willingness to listen and make some changes. It comes on a, a crust of some mis, uh, mistakes made with uh, electors of color and misnaming and two of them are women and in a space that we have to stand with our black women I want to do that so I want to make sure I lifted up uh, that story was uh, not good and did not represent uh, the assembly member or the work that she's done so I want to make sure I mention that um, uh, but uh, as for the question and even the previous question you know I, I think I, I want to rephrase it a little bit because I don't know um, that the on the ground thing hasn't things haven't changed I think people have been working on this stuff for a very long time. What has happened is people in power are now listening. I don't know how long they're gonna listen for. I've seen the governor and other folks start to even make some changes now that maybe because folks aren't in the street, um, but hopefully um, you know, some of the good things he's doing actually will, will, will move forward. Uh, so I think people are listening in a way that they haven't. And I'm, I'm actually worried about the collective amnesia uh, that may occur. Uh, it is difficult for folks to disassociate uh, the equation of police and public safety. That's just a difficult thing to do because it's so ingrained in our culture. And then the police department becomes a catch-all for anything that we can't figure out, call 911. Uh, and that has caused tremendous problems. And so um, I think it's, we have both practical and political issues. We do have to remember that people want to be safe and actually feel safe. Sometimes it's actually danger, more dangerous when people don't feel safe, even if they are. And we do have to address both of those things. Sometimes we try to uh, not address one or the other, and we have to address both. People have a right to be safe, have a right for the government to respond, uh, and they have a right to feel safe. Uh, but what we've seen is this resistance uh, to releasing police from having that whole public uh, safety space, which is even strange, because even as they're doing this, I think they're doing a uh, stand with blue thing tomorrow, um, the, the, the thing that to pose and pretend that folks are not supporting blue because we're saying you're doing too much makes no sense. <laughs> what, what tends to happen is that there are people who want to hold on to a system of privilege that frankly is uh, uh, trust by the police um, is a very real thing. And it takes time to knock that down. And we haven't had the political courage to do that. As a matter of fact, uh, and I appreciate the work that was done in the council along with the chair. Recently, we've had to, we've had been in the position of having to thank people who have been blocking these changes for a very long time. So that was uh, quite interesting. But we should be in this conversation of what does public safety look like and what is law enforcement's role in there? Because as I say, anyone who says that law enforcement has no role, they're not having a real conversation. Anyone who says law enforcement is the primary role, they're not having a real conversation. And so my office has put form a platform. I invite everyone to go to it, advocate.nyc.gov, 10 points of how we can reimagine public safety and what are the things uh, that are too much in that department right now that they don't need to be involved in. And I, I believe that's a point where everybody can agree, um, but it's very hard to have the discussion when people um, are, are very stuck in, in, in ways that have been ingrained in us for a very long time. Uh, I, I'd, like, uh, I'd like to invite the other panelists here to weigh in. How do you see the new the, the question around public safety, particularly um, not just policing, but in the wake of this pandemic, what do you think people need um, to feel safe, to feel safe returning to work, to school, um, and what can the city be doing to, to promote public safety as we, as we see it? Uh, Renee? Sure, thanks. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say I'm honored to be on this panel as well. Um, I really appreciated uh, Mr. Williams' point about thinking more broadly about public safety rather than the traditional police enforcement role. So the company that I work for within the realm of public safety, we do traffic enforcement, so camera-based automated enforcement 
which may seem like a small part of public safety, but in fact is the number one reason why a resident and a law enforcement officer would have an interaction in the first place. So if you can remove an officer from that equation, you're reducing risk both in the sense right now of COVID transmission, but also in the sense of the, the risk of escalating tension between law enforcement and residents. Um, I would also say to the point about public safety, I'm an urban planner and a former New Yorker and public safety includes the ability and the freedom to walk and ride and use public streets and public assets free from danger. Um, I, you know, I'm aware of uh, New York's emphasis on Vision Zero. Unfortunately, there were 218 traffic deaths in New York last year. Over half of those were pedestrians, and those are disproportionately in low-income and black and brown communities. So for us as a vendor, anything that we can do to help cities reach their Vision Zero goals and keep people safe is something that we're interested in supporting. I think you're on mute. All right. Yeah. yeah, Craig, um, I know you've talked about the challenges around mental health and people's emotional and mental well-being, especially in the wake of this pandemic and the, and the protests um, and the often violent crackdown by police. Um, could you speak to that? Sure, thank you. And um, I'm also honored to be on this panel and I couldn't agree more uh, with Council Member Richards and Public Advocate Williams in terms of the need to shift our resources um, to be much more preventive in the first place and to address the social determinants of health. Um, Catholic Guardian Services, my organization, uh, is a nonprofit. We've been in here in existence for 130 years and working in some of the most disadvantaged communities here. Uh, I've been with Catholic Guardian for 24 years and never have I heard my staff and the people that we serve speak more loudly um, than during um, the, the protests and in the wake of the horrific murder of uh, George Floyd. Um, I've never heard them speak with more pain and more anger and a, a more urgency for change. Um, my staff and the people that we serve are 95% people of color. And um, when they walk outside, um, first of all, we are uh, first line um, services. We've always been on the front lines during the, the entire pandemic, um, operating 24 7, seven days a week, uh, 365 days a year. So my staff have to go to work. And when they step outside their doors, they feel like they are another uh, George Floyd. They, the, their families, and they're afraid. Um, they're very afraid that they could be targeted just based on the color of their skin, just going to work. And, and my staff and the people that we serve also wanted to take part in the peaceful protests that were happening. Um, but again, full of anxiety, full of fear, fear that they might lose their jobs, but also fear that they might be harmed by the police. And so one of the things that we did to, to assist is we brought in the Legal Aid Society to conduct training for both staff and the people that we serve to know their rights. Because knowing your rights gives you power. Um, it gives you the ability to control your person and your reaction to a greater extent than in the absence of knowing your rights. So knowing your rights included stay calm, be respectful, be observant, ask for a business card, remember badge numbers, refuse all searches, request an attorney, refuse all drinks, food and smoke, and or anything that captures your DNA, report any violated rights. And we also taught them not to negotiate, argue, curse, or yell, or resist arrest. And and not to speak after you say that you will remain silent. And I think that by educating our staff and our residents, they felt a little better. Um, the anxiety is always there because our society remains our society, at, at, which is uh, full of inequality um, and full of battles for people to secure their rights. So uh, 
there's still that ever present anxiety, but I think our people, our staff and our residents felt better know having the power of knowledge to, to know what their rights are. So I guess this, this raises a question about, uh, and I guess uh, public advocate Williams, you, you raised this as well. If, if residents don't feel safe, then does it matter if they are actually safe? Um, and if we're asking the police to, if we're asking people to know their rights, shouldn't we be asking more of police officers whose job, whose duty is, it is to sort of keep people safe? Uh, Tom, I want to bring you in here because I know you've talked about um, training and um, retraining officers. You work on non-lethal restraint methods. Um, how do you see, is, is, it, is, it, should we be, is it the police's responsibility or the people's responsibility? Is it a shared responsibility? What, what do you think? Well, again, and I, I'm super excited to be part of this panel because these are important topics. And a lot of times it's super easy to point out a problem, but you have to get down to solutions. And I commend the work that's being done in New York City, the council member uh, Richards for this and, and public advocate Williams for, for getting involved in these discussions because they're very difficult discussions. And if you look at police specifically, my career has been about providing them tools to reduce violence. My my brother and I started Taser in 1993 because we had two friends get shot and killed uh, in, in a drive-by shooting and we were looking at alternatives. You know, we grew up watching Star Trek and Star Wars and said, why can't we get to a place where we don't have to give them the caveman's club that's been collapsed or a food ingredient like pepper spray that you throw in somebody's eye that rely on pain to stop somebody. And the last tool that was introduced was 25 years ago. And look at how technology has changed in all aspects of our lives. So even this panel being done remotely through Zoom, everything changes constantly, but tools available to police haven't changed in 25 years. And it's the old adage, if I give a person a hammer, everything's gonna look like a nail. So as we have these discussions, technology, training, policy, all are critical for the implementation of changing the way policing is done in, in the conversations that are being had here and the tools available to them so that we can evolve, we can adapt, we can, we can have these discussions, we can change those encounters. Because I remember a day not long ago that, you know, I listened to Craig's comments about knowing your rights and things where police were looked at, you would go looking and seek them out for help. You would seek that it was friendly, it was interactive, and, and you know, the community is gonna be working with politicians and law enforcement to bring that back. And at RAP Technologies, we're looking at ways to integrate the use of technology to use a tool, the only tool available to police today that does not rely on pain compliance. It works from a distance. It does not hurt the individual. And then also implementing good training, good policy, and working with politicians and the communities to make sure that we're providing police technology and tools and changing the way that that policing is being done that's acceptable to the community members and that they have a bigger voice in how that's being done. So again, I, I congratulate uh, the folks on this panel for having these uh, very open and positive discussions to help affect change. Now, um, I wanna get to sort of the central point. Um, I think this, and this is what came up during the budget okay. debate is- Can you hear what, me? Yes. Um, right. I, oh, I, do you I, want to respond to that? Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, so, it's something, to something you were posing before about who, whose responsibility is it. One, I definitely think, and we have to be clear, that public safety is a shared responsibility, um, and law enforcement is a part of that partnership. And so, we have to be clear about that. Um, what, what often happens is, again, we're doing here as well. We we focus in on policing, and I, and I want to be clear: there are reforms that have to address accountability and transparency. Minnesota had most of them. And so we have to open it up. And very often we'll ask, and they'll show me surveys of people who say they want more police in the community. But I always ask, well, where was the survey about them wanting additional housing, additional education, uh, additional health, uh, um, uh, health uh, resources? Those questions never come up. And I think you see a lot of answers if you ask the context differently. Uh, well, that was, that was my second question, um, um, which is, uh, you know, we, we, we want to take away a lot of these roles that the police play, and this was central to the budget debate, um, sort of civilianizing uh, services for response to the homeless, response to uh, people experiencing emotional distress, uh, emotional and mental health crises, and um, response to everything from even, even protests, for instance. Uh, now, what I'm, so how do you think the city can, or even school safety, for instance, 
how do you think this city can do that? And are the challenges, as I said earlier, more practical or political? Is it the city faces a big budget crisis? Is it, does it have enough funds to invest in these services? And does, is there enough political will, even when the governor is saying we need to reimagine police, but his first instinct is, is to send police at every non-crime problem, including homelessness or social distancing? 